Thank you, Brother Larry, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's, uh, as we said yesterday, a pleasure to be here and to uh, be able to have fellowship with all of you here this week. Um, I want to start off by saying this is um, some new material for me, so uh, that's by way of um, begging your forgiveness. If uh, there's a few errors here and there or points that you can help me with, uh, I've only actually given this once before, it was in Prince George uh, just back in May, and I just have to kind of tell a story about going through customs, uh, going through uh, Vancouver. Uh, it was really strange, as Mary Kay and I were going through customs, the customs officer really started interrogating me as to what we were doing going up uh, to British Columbia, and instead of just saying we're going to visit friends, which would have been probably the smart thing to say. Uh, I told him we were going up for a church gathering, and he asked me why so I was speaking. I guess that triggers for them a concern that you might be taking income away. Uh, and so uh, what, uh, they didn't ask me what I was being paid for or anything, but he started asking me questions about, well, what's your topic? And I told him, well, it's about the, the period of time, uh, about the, the second temple period, kind of dealing from the period of, uh, let's say, Ezra, all the way through uh, the period of time of Nehemiah. And he said, uh, he asked me a couple more questions, and finally he said, well, why don't you pick that, qu that topic? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't say it, but what I really wanted to say was because I didn't know better. <laughs> Uh, it covers a long period of time, and I just want to say by disclaimer here, we're not going to be able to deal with all of the material. And um, one of the things that for me has been quite interesting is really trying to just get a better sense of the history of this period. It's a, it's a history-packed area, and it gets us into um, some of the information about uh, kings of Persia, some things we, should, we need to know, other things perhaps we don't have to know as much. Uh, so what I hope is we'll touch on some of those things, but primarily what this study is about is hopefully exhortational, but mostly for us to take a look at our ecclesias today. And so we'll have a few words about that as we go through. So here are the classes for the week. We're uh, starting off with a call to return home, which is dealing with uh, not only them being brought into Babylon, and then later uh, we see the scenes of uh, uh, Shushan, uh, but also the, uh, the ability for them to be able to return home, who actually does go home. Um, also, um, we'll look at uh, tomorrow, uh, Consider Your Ways, which was a very important uh, message to them, that they needed to use uh, self-examination in their lives, and we're going to argue tomorrow that is probably one of the most important lessons that comes out throughout Scripture, is the issue of don't let self-examination break down. When that happens, uh, it is the root of all evil, uh, for not only for ourselves personally, but in our ecclesias. We'll then look at uh, this wonderful section that we read about, both in uh, Haggai and also in Zechariah that talks about the day of small things. And we hope to be able to connect that to the way that perhaps we should look at our ecclesias uh, in modern times. We'll look at the Nehemiah talking about rising up and building. We'll then move on to look at the period of Malachi where we look at the priesthood. And finally, we'll try to bring that back together and say, okay, so we live in the day of small things. Not the day of great things, not the things that we look forward to in the kingdom age. Uh, what is it like for us now? What are some of the lessons for us living in this age today? So that's hopefully what we'll be uh, uh, going through this week. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was in Europe and I had the, uh, I don't know if it's the word opportunity, but I had the experience of going to Auschwitz and to Birkenau, which is actually that, that uh, picture. And if you've not been there, these are uh, these are places where you go to, you never really have seen anything quite like it. Um, I'll spare you the details. Um, if, if you've been there, you know that there's nothing quite like uh, the inhumanity and, and terror of these places. But I thought it was really interesting that there's a sign when you first walk in uh, from 
uh, George Santayana, which says those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And that's why they've spent so much time and money to keep uh, restored this particular site. By the way, I, I find it's, you know, Americans are everywhere. You go to this site that is one of the most infamous places in the world, and you're getting your mind prepared to go into this place. And as you're about to go in there, you pull into the driveway, and over here is KFC, and there's McDonald's on the other side. It's just you can't get away from this stuff. Uh, but the point here that I found to be uh, not only important for this visit, but also important for us in the truth, is to be able to look back at these examples, as we're going to see in this, this second temple period, and be able to try to look at what happened, what did they learn, what did they do right, and what did they not do right, and be able to say, well, what can we learn from that today in order for us to have our ecclesias remain strong in the last days before the Lord's return? Now, when we read verses like this, and we, have, we can have a whole bunch of verses like this, such as this one in Luke 21 in the Olivet Prophecy, where the Lord is talking about the, the big challenges of what I think is question three, uh, that is asked by the apostles, which is uh, dealing with the, the things of the very last times. And his comment is this, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen, and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. And you add things like this, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, where he says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, scoffers walking after their lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So we're, we're aware of the prophecies about our day. And the real question in my mind is, we can look at this in a fatalistic way. We can wave the, the white flag. And perhaps we might even look at things like um, you know, the overwhelming affluence that we see across Christadelphia, particularly in North America. Um, we can look at things like apathy, and we can look at them in terms of, well, this is what was prophesied was going to happen. We can have a fatalistic kind of a, a view about this. And frankly, brothers and sisters, I hear the, this, kind of, this kind of thought being expressed when we see in our ecclesias things that we would never have accepted that we would never have soundly exhorted about and warned each other about. Um, but we perhaps think of it in terms of, well, this is what was prophesied in the last, last days, and we just kind of move along. Now, I like to suggest, I think that's just a really wrong way for us to be thinking. So, why the study of the Second Temple? That's what the customs officer uh, asked me. Um, First of all, there's a lot of similarities between what they were going through and what we're going through right now. What they were waiting for was the Messiah. Now, we're, 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 we're uh, waiting for his return and for the great establishment of his kingdom, but they too had the promise of the Messiah, and they were struggling in ecclesial life, really struggling. Um, there were those who had been taken into captivity into Babylon, and you know, it was actually a lot better in Babylon for them. I mean, from a material standpoint. They had been under uh, really very turbulent times in the land before captivity, and they had become pretty comfortable. And when the opportunity to come back actually is given, many of them decide not to come back because they were in comfort in Babylon. And when the temple is rebuilt, when they finally look at the temple, they say, okay, 
There are some people who look at it that were alive and saw Solomon's temple in all of its glory and splendor. And when they looked at this temple, it just did not measure up. And it says there are those, it, it, it's a wonderful passage, we'll look at it, that the, 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 the joy and, and the screaming that was positive uh, was as loud as those who were weeping over the view of how the standard wasn't the same for that particular temple. And some of them, because of that, were disillusioned. When they looked at the temple that was rebuilt, it just didn't measure up. I don't suppose you've ever thought of the Ecclesia that way. So we'll look at this when we get uh, into our class tomorrow. And for many, many, self-examination was absolutely broken. By the time we get to Malachi, it's not only the people who have had their self-examination broken, it's the priests, the ones that are supposed to be warning them, who are serving bread, which is moldy, which is uh, inappropriate to be, uh, to be offered. You know, offering the blind lamb, uh, that, you know, things that you say to yourself, how, who did they think they were serving? Did they not know that God could tell these things? Well, for them, there was something fundamentally broken, and that was the ability to look inside their own lives and their own hearts and examine themselves. And they were struggling to deal with decay and with apathy. It was all around them. Sounds kind of familiar. And then also, leadership. The leadership, the very leadership that was supposed to be there to help them stay away from sin, we're going to see actually was enabling them to sin. It wasn't that they were neutral, they were actually enabling sin. So the question about all of these things is that what can we learn from these stories about their reform? I would suggest that that's where we are in North America. Uh, Brother Joe and I were having a discussion this morning about how different the truth is in our lifetime. In our lifetime, how we see now that there's, what, Joe, 50% or more that don't speak English in the Christadelphians. Just, I mean, think about that, the change that we see in our own lives. Um, it, but in North America, we're, you know, rough, we're roughly six, seven thousand Christadelphians. Uh, that's not even the size of the number of Christadelphians in Malawi. So how are we supposed to look at North America? Are we supposed to look at North America? Well, you know, it's too bad. Things passed us by and uh, we're just going to have to hold on or we look for reform. And that's really the message I hope will come out of these studies. Now, there really are three temples, but there are oftentimes referred to as two temple periods. Uh, and that's largely because we, we, are, we, we certainly, I think even our youngsters would know that there was Solomon's temple. They might not know about Zerubbabel's temple, uh, but there is certainly the period of time where in about 516 B.C., and again, anytime you hear these dates, there, there's always five different sources you can find with different dates. But roughly around 516 B.C., and that lasted until Herod began his work on that same spot by taking what was a dilapidated temple and rebuilding it into beginning that process, uh, which actually was, uh, was, was finished just a little bit before 70 AD. Uh, and then as soon as it was finished, it actually was uh, to be destroyed soon thereafter. So there are these three temples and two temple periods that you could uh, put together. Now, this is very busy, and in the back, I'm sure it's going to be difficult to be able to see it. But it's important for us just to kind of get our timing on things. So if we were to look at the establishment of the tabernacle, that would go back to about, let's say, 1250 B.C. Uh, Solomon's temple would have been uh, roughly about 968 B.C. Remember, David lives uh, about uh, a thousand years before the time of Christ. Solomon's temple about 968. And then we get to the destruction of that temple. Now that's a fairly 
uh, agreed on date, which is uh, about 586, 587 BC. And then finally, uh, Zerubbabel's reconstruction of the temple was completed about 515. And then we have to skip all the way to 19 BC uh, before we get to the time where Zerubbabel's temple uh, has been dismantled and replaced by the work of, of, uh, of Herod. So those are the periods that we're going to be looking at as we go through. And really, the period we're going to be looking at is what I just darkened here. Let me go back so I can read it. Um, this will be the period of time uh, which will be following the period uh, right in our Bibles uh, uh, with um, Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, as we're going to be moving into Ezra uh, and the, the, these periods. One of the real interesting pieces, of course, about the way our Bibles are uh, constructed is, uh, is how off geographically this section is. Uh, that we see places like Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, which were really, uh, Nehemiah would have been somebody who would have been contemporary with a person like Malachi, which is at the very end of our Old Testament Bibles. But the period of time that we'll be looking at is right here. So another way of thinking of this is really to think of some of the, the writings that deal with specific issues. In this period of time, you have Second Chronicles, you have Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel, all of which are dealing with prophecies about the uh, return to Jerusalem out of captivity and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. You then have the work itself being spoken about, and that's in Ezra and Nehemiah. And then you have three prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, all of which are exhortations to the people about their, not only the work and completing the work, but about them being spiritually right with God, which was really the most important thing. So that might be another way to look at this period. Um, Brother Ashton, in his book, The Exile's Return, which is a, a very good book, I highly recommend it, uh, talks about it this way. He says there's 70 years where they were serving Babylon. And if you go back even before that, back to the time of the Assyrians, Sennacherib goes into northern, uh, the northern ten tribes and takes 200,000 captives into Assyria and, of course, brings Assyrians down into the land. And there's a long period of time until 598 when Nebuchadnezzar then comes in to Judah, carries away Jehoiachin and uh, 10,000 captives, and um, uh, takes the uh, temple treasures with him. And then we have the 70 years of desolation of the temple, starting with the burning of the temple, uh, Cyrus making his decree around 536, uh, allowing them to go back. The work getting started, the temple foundation being laid, then we have a big delay that occurs. And finally, under Darius, we see the work resuming, and finally the temple work being finished. And then the remaining work, we read about uh, accounts such as the book of Esther. We read about Ezra uh, returning back to the land, Nehemiah returning back to the land, and then being recalled by Artaxerxes, and finally Nehemiah going back again and returning to Jerusalem. So uh, if, if, if this helps you, it's, it's kind of a, an overview, the context of the period of time that we're going to be talking about. Now in order for us to understand a little bit about um, the period of time we're going to be talking, we have to understand where Israel came from. Uh, the, the state of Israel had been so bad that God had to take drastic action to be able to save his people. They would have been lost by assimilation. And what we see in Isaiah's first six chapters, as he describes over and over the, the different parts of what we read about, about, about Israel, you hear themes that keep coming up over and over again. The first one was this idea of fleshly pride. That we can do what we want, that we can, we can go after the things that we want to be involved with. Uh, and we'll look at a verse here in a moment, which I think just really fits that kind of mentality. 
But there's also this constant um, view of how they had lost the ability to look at their own behavior and just couldn't see it. Anymore. And then also inadequate spiritual leadership. These were really some of the things that Isaiah was dealing with during this period of time. Now, we will not take time to go through all this, but this is a, 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 a real condemnation of all the commandments that are stipulated on the left-hand side of this chart. Not only the Ten Commandments, but all the other things that they were told in Scripture that they were commanded not to do. What we read about in Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, what we read about is the, the chronicling of how they systematically went about violating all of these commandments. Not a few of them, every one of them. And that's how lost they had become. Now this is the verse I think that really kind of captures how bad they were. There's, and, and the word here, laden, is just a great word to describe how sinful these people were. Uh, in Isaiah uh, chapter 1 verse 4, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children of their corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. This idea of being laid it down, I'm not really sure what country this is from, but I, I found this picture because you can see that these people not only are laden down, but they're actually beginning to physically impact them. Uh, even when they're not carrying that burden, they're still going to be bent over. And this is... This is really what was going on with the spiritual collapse of Israel. They were a people who were just burdened with sin. It was something that was the uh, something that they were laden with iniquity. Well, we see that uh, in Jeremiah chapter 23 at verse 14 it says, "I have I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem a horrible thing." So these are the prophets. They commit adultery. And walk in lies. They strengthen also the hand of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. So not only were these prophets at the time of, of Isaiah's day contemptible, but what they were doing is not only participating themselves in sin, but enabling sin and failing to be able to live up to any of the responsibilities to the flock about repentance. So this is this chart, we'll, we'll refer to this a few times, is really kind of what we're going to see uh, as we move through this. We're going to see that in Israel's history, there seems to be a period of time where you see affluence, they're doing well, they're getting comfortable, and that leads to an arrogance, fleshly pride. What comes next? Apathy. What comes next? Apostasy. And finally, when God intervenes, there finally can be um, reformation. Now the question you might ask yourself is, if we look at our own fellowship, because this is the value to us, if we were to say, well, where, where do you think we are? Where do you think we are on this? Affluence and arrogance, fleshly pursuits, you might see some of that, right? How about apathy? Any ecclesias out there dealing with apathy in your uh, ecclesias? So just by extension, what's the next big threat you would expect? It's the threat to the very truth that we all hold to. So this is something we'll deal with a little bit later, but this is what we see occurring with Israel and in the prophecy of Isaiah. It was something that uh, really kind of labeled what was going on with Israel throughout their demise. Of course, this is something that was prophesied all the way back into Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy chapter 28. We won't read the whole passage, but it, we're told in, uh, that in, in Deuteronomy, 20, Deuteronomy 28, the Lord shall bring thee and thy king, which thou, which thou shalt set over thee, 
unto a nation which neither thou nor thy fathers have known, and there shalt thou serve other gods, wood and stone. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. And he both shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fenced walls come down, wherein thou trustest throughout all thy land. And he will besiege thee. So this was something that were, was identifying for them that this is what they could expect because of these conditions. So what we really like to pick up with now is this idea about captivity in Babylon. Uh, what a remarkable place Babylon must have been. Uh, at least for tourists, right? Uh, it would have, uh, they, they describe places like um, this, when you move into Ishtar Gate, which is that big, beautiful blue gate that had the lions on it, that's actually been uh, recreated now in Germany in a, in a museum. Uh, it is, uh, it's interesting, they talk about, you know, golden paved roads going in. You know, we all know that one of the seven wonders of the world, the uh, Hanging Gardens, was there. Uh, incredible wealth, by far the wealthiest nation that had ever uh, been known at that time. And they were taken into captivity. Now, there were those who were longing, even though they were in Babylon and all this wealth and things actually started going better for them, uh, there were those who never lost sight of the truth. We read about this in Psalm 137, where it talks about by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down, yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, they that carried us away captive required of us of a song. And they that wasted us required us of us a mirth, of, of mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. <coughs> How shall we sing the Lord's song in this strange land? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I do not remember thee, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. Now there were some that were in Babylon that felt this way, who stayed focused on the return back to the land to be able to rebuild the temple for that period of time that they'd heard prophesied to elapse, to allow them to be able to restore themselves as God's people living back in the land. But it's important that they were to be told, they were told that they were sent to Babylon not only for punishment, but for their good. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 23 and verses 5 and 6, we read this, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, uh, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of, King, of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set mine eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pluck them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. So what was going on in Babylon was for their good. Now, so you might ask yourself, well, why, why would that be good for them to go to Babylon? Well, first of all, as it started out in Babylon, historically we're told that they were initially secluded in separate camps and ghettos, which is kind of common to the experience of much of Israel's uh, history. They were secluded. And when they got to Babylon, what they undoubtedly would have been seeing is a level of godlessness and idolatry that would have probably repulsed many of them. And they were forced to come face to face with the consequences of their sin. You know, sin can continue along until sometimes you finally run into the consequence for your sin. And then it brings it right up into your face to recognize what, it, what has actually happened because of your sin. And there would have been undoubtedly an awareness of what they had lost. So I think it's very possible it helped to define and maybe even refine as they were exposed to the idolatry and the fleshly pride of Babylon. And it focused those who were 
uh, of the right mind, those who talk regularly about the truth, it focused them on how important the return to the land was going to be. This is going to be an important thing for us, too, because one of the important things for us in our quest, in our time where we find ourselves living in somewhat of a babble on ourselves, is to be focused on the promise of the return, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and a better day that's coming. But this was part of what was going on for them. Now, it's interesting, though, what began to happen over time is that things started getting comfortable. Well, first of all, Jewish infrastructure established. Eventually, there was a place you could go down and get bagels. There was a place you could get anything you were looking for, and it was right there. Um, it allowed them to settle by what was really an irrigation ditch, which is the Kibar River. But it allowed them to, uh, to build and to farm. And they now reached a standard of living which was better than when they had been back in the land particularly under the famine that they had had and the ravages of the foreign armies that had been coming down upon them. They're actually living right now relatively free from persecution and they were able to retain their priests, their prophets, and their elders and also to uh, occupy houses and really kind of settle into a normal life. Uh, you, some of you may have a copy of this book by Leon Wood, it's uh, a survey of Israel's history. He said that the, in Babylon, the thing that was really important for the people was, first of all, that the institutions that they would, had been used to in, in Israel, they were able to bring largely and reestablish in Babylon. And they did have a, le a relative amount of freedom of movement. They were able to write and have correspondence privileges back to the people in the land. They were well employed. Many of them did quite well. And they were living in a fertile and well-watered land, right there in that fertile crescent area. So in a lot of ways, it was pretty comfortable. But they were told by God that he was still with them during this period of time. And he tells them that while you're in Babylon, while you've been carried away, um, I want you to build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them, take wives and beget sons and daughters. Um, you know, regular parts of life, do this, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captives. Seek the peace. And pray unto the Lord for it, and for the peace of it, there, thereof shall ye have peace. So they were actually to pray for the peace of Babylon, the place that they've been taken, while they were looking forward to the time of returning back to the land. So the land was restored, but the people had not been cast off. Um, the, uh, the land also, this is from Leviticus 26, the land also shall be left of them, and shall enjoy her Sabbaths, while she lieth desolate without them. And they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity, because even because they, um, uh, even because they despise my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. And yet, for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them. For I am the Lord their God, for I, and, but I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. So Leviticus 26 talks extensively about this and that he would not break his covenant, but remember it and bring them back into the land. So let's see if we can kind of put this all back together for a moment. Israel had been on the precipice of being completely lost in sin. They were, they were without repair. God had sent prophets to them, and they didn't listen to the prophets. They persecuted those prophets. 
But God had brought about, because of this, a severe judgment on Jerusalem. And he saved many, and he placed them, really, in what was an ideal location for them to begin to change the way they, th they think and to be able to be restored to peaceful times. He put them in a land where they could retain their identity and where they could actually have prosper, where they could prosper. And he placed them at an idolatrous extreme so that they could see just what that looks like and they could begin to see themselves as a separate people. And what he primarily did is he got them focused not on their fleshly pursuits of the day, but on the future and the promised return. Of course, that then takes us to this Persian window of opportunity. And this is the time where they're able to begin to return back home. Um, Jeremiah 51 at verse 11. Make bright the arrows, gather the shields. The Lord hath raised up the spirit of the king, uh, kings of the Medes for his devices against Babylon to destroy it. Because it is the vengeance of the Lord the vengeance of his temple. So the beginnings were to start uh, right away, and that was, was the time of the Medes. And of course, remember, Jeremiah had been told that they would return back to the land. Don't destroy the deeds, all the things that are the claims that you have of a purchase of a land. Take the evidences. Take the purchase uh, documents. Keep them, because when you return, you're going to go back and you're going to possess your vineyards and your fields and your houses. Well, it sounds a little bit similar to what we might think of in our own lives. So what God's doing is he's revealing his plan for the redemption of Israel. And he reveals the nations that are going to be involved. Babylon, the Medes. He doesn't reveal every detail. He doesn't tell us every single part of it. But he provides an outline and an understanding of the time frame. And he asks fundamentally for Israel to believe in his power and his ability to bring about his plan. And if they do this, they will be able to watch the plan unfold and then to take comfort in the return to the land. But they needed to be watchful, be looking for the signs, and be ready. And don't be entangled in the city of Babylon. Now, there are just a lot of things here that sound really familiar. It sounds a lot like the day and the age that we live in. Being watchful, looking for the signs. We don't have every detail, but we, we have the names of the nations, don't we? We have the plan, and we can see it unfold. And what the message for us is, don't be entangled in the Babylon of our lives. We won't spend much time on this except to say that there are a number of Persian kings that are mentioned in the Bible and some that are not. Uh, a couple of uh, things. First of all, we're going to be looking at Cyrus in a moment. Uh, we're going to read about uh, his proclamation, which is very important. Uh, then we hear about Ahasuerus, uh, which is mentioned in, in Ezra chapter 4, verse 6. This person right here, who is called Artaxerxes, is a very interesting person in this unfolding of this history of time. And look how long he rules. About a half a year. And it just happens to coincide whenever the uh, people of the land go to the Persian king to get the building to stop. It's a very interesting period of time. Then followed by uh, Darius, as you can see, uh, goes on through a period of time. So we're going to come back to these Persian kings, but the one that we want to focus on right now is obviously going to be dealing with Cyrus. In Isaiah 43, we're told, Thus saith the Lord, uh, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I have sent to Babylon and have brought down all their nobles and the Chaldeans whose cries in the ships. I am the Lord and your Holy One, the Creator of Israel your king. So he was going to bring down his Babylon. And the way he was going to do that, obviously, was by giving the battle over to the Medes. Um, Isaiah 44, that confirmeth the word of his servant and performeth the counsel of his messengers, 
that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited into the cities of Judah, ye shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof, that saith to the deep, Be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers, that saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to thy temple, thy foundation shall be laid. So this is a prophecy that's about 150 years before the birth of Cyrus. And his name is actually given to us. And that's what we read in Isaiah 44. Isaiah 45 goes on to say, uh, talk about how this will be given to him, uh, that it will be given to him by God. And then he goes on to say, not only have I said these things, but I have surnamed thee, Though thou hast not known me, uh, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God besides me. Besides me. So this prophecy about what was going to happen, and the prophecy about the Cyrus who was to come, was certainly done well, well before uh, Cyrus came onto the scene. But let's make no mistake about Cyrus. He was no uh, God-fearing man. This was not. Uh, so, clearly, he may have been influenced by Daniel, may have been influenced by others who were there, but he certainly was, was not a man who you would say was a God-fearing man. Even though we have very interesting passages uh, about him talking about how he acknowledged God. Um, but it's interesting that he had lulled the Babylonians into this inactivity because he had gone to war with, uh, uh, with Lydia, which was a potential ally for Babylon. And he takes maximum advantage of this uh, because there's this developing discontent that's happening in Babylon. And basically what happens is he walks right into the city. The military campaign against Babylon uh, came also almost as an anti-climax. And in the late summer of 539 BC, uh, he and his armies marched into the city. Uh, he seized the hands of the statue of the city of uh, the city god uh, of Babylon, and as a signal of his willingness to rule as a Babylonian king uh, and not as a foreign conqueror, he was actually hailed by many in Babylon as a legitimate successor to his throne. So he, when he came in, he was able to do this in a very wise way. And one of the incredible things that we read about with the, the Cyrus Cylinder and really about Persia in general was that this was a great time if you are of another religion to be able to practice your religion under these people. Uh, this under the Cyrus Cylinder from 539 BC. I announced that I will respect the traditions, customs, and religions of the nations of my empire and never let any of my governors and subordinates look down on or insult them while I am alive. Uh, from now on, I never let anyone oppress any others, and if it occurs, I will take his or her right back and penalize the oppressor. I will never let anyone take possession of movable and landed properties of the others by force or without compensation, which is kind of interesting as he gives back the things that were taken by Nebuchadnezzar from the temple to, uh, to go back to the land. While I'm alive, I prevent unpaid forced labor. Today, I announce that everyone is free to choose a religion. People are free to live in all regions and to take up a job, provided they will never violate others' rights. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? And it was, a, it was a really important condition for allowing the return of Israel back into the land. And of course, we read this in uh, 2 Chronicles, now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord uh, spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. So this is Cyrus's doings. And he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God given me, and he hath changed me, charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God 
be with him and let him go up. So we have this period of time. Now it's interesting that Daniel was born approximately around 623 BC. And at the age of 90, he may have actually lived long enough to be able to see the beginning of the return back into the land and the completion of that temple foundation. So the proclamation continues. Now, the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah be fulfilled. The Lord, uh, the Lord stirred up the spirit of king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath ch charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? Let his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. So we see that his spirit was stirred up. This was a Cyrus doing this of his own thinking, but rather something that was stirred up. And uh, we see that this is true that uh, in, in Ezra chapter 1, the chief of the fathers of Judah, Benjamin, and the priests and the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised. So they are the ones that go back to the land. So who's in control of this? Who's making this happen? Well, Cyrus is under the control of God, and it's him stirring them up, and also it's the people who return to the land whose spirit God had raised. Now, there's another additional detail, and we're going to end with this slide here, that in the first year of Cyrus the king, the same Cyrus the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be built, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid. The height thereof, three square cubits, and the breadth thereof, three, three square cubits, with three rows of great stones, and a row of new timber, and let the expenses be given out of the king's house. You might ask yourself, how did he get all these ideas about what the size should be, and what the cost might be? And also, let the, gold, the golden and the silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple, which is at Jerusalem, and brought into Babylon, be restored, and brought again unto the temple, which is at Jerusalem, everyone to his place, and place them in the house of God. I'm going to go one more slide here, which is just, oh, actually, to this, which is to say, actually that's about four slides, you see that? Um, they, which was that when they began to return, what happens, it says, then rose up the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests of the Levites, with all them whose spirit God had raised up, to go to build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all they that were about them strengthened their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, and with beasts, and with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. Also, Cyrus the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had brought forth. Uh, even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of Midradath, the treasurer, and numbered unto them Sheshbazzar, the prince of Judah. Now we know that name, but not in that form. That's Zerubbabel. And that's what we're going to pick up tomorrow.